One of the things we talked about today was the second derivative test, and this is a test that's good for determining pretty quickly whether a, a critical point is a local max or a local min. Now the second derivative test is maybe the quickest way to do this if it works. The trade-off is that something sometimes it doesn't work. So let's see what it says. Let's suppose I have f prime of a equals zero, and f double prime of a is positive. Now if f double prime of a is positive, Remember our mnemonic, that means we're concave up. So a would be somewhere in here. And if the derivative is zero, that means we're here at this critical point. And we can see that this is a local minimum. So if you have a critical point and you plug it into the second derivative and get a positive number, that critical point has to be a local minimum. If I'm in the other case and I have my second derivative negative, that means I'm concave down, I see the critical point on a concave down section is a local maximum. So if you take your critical point, plug it into your second derivative and get something negative, that critical point has to be a local maximum. Now notice this test doesn't say anything about critical points whose second derivatives are zero. The test doesn't tell you what's going on if the second derivative is zero, you have to do something else. Let's practice applying this. Suppose this is my function and I want to know it's uh, local maxes and local mins. Local maxes and mins only occur at critical points and singular points, but this function doesn't have any singular points, so let's find its critical points. Like normal, we take the derivative and find where it's equal to zero. By factoring the first derivative, we find that the critical points occur when x is equal to 2 and when x is equal to minus 1. So let's try to apply the second derivative test. Here's the second derivative. If I plug in 2, I get 3 times 4 minus 3, which is positive. So that puts me here. And that says that x equals 2 is the point of a local max. Pretty easy. Now let's try to apply it to the other critical point. I'm going to plug in minus 1. But if I plug in minus 1, I get 3 times 1 minus 3, which is equal to 0 which means the second derivative test doesn't tell me what's going on at zero. It could be a local max, it could be a local min, it could be an inflection point. So in order to find this out, we're going to have to go back to the way we used to do it, which was we look at the sign of the derivative. So here's my critical point at negative 1, and I know that f of negative 1, f prime of negative 1 is equal to zero. That's how we got it. It's a critical point. So the question now is, what is the derivative a little bit to the left of negative 1 and a little bit to the right of negative 1? Well, if I go up here to my derivative, I know that a little bit to the left or right of negative 1, this term here, because it's squared, it's going to be positive. If I'm close to negative 1, it's going to be positive. And if I'm close to negative 1, this is going to be negative. And notice, it doesn't matter if I'm a little bigger or a little smaller than negative 1, because even though this sign might change, we square it. So my, my derivative is negative, just a little to the left of negative 1, a little to the right of negative 1. So that means I'm decreasing, and then I'm 0, and then I continue decreasing. So this is not a local max, and it's not a local min. So we probably suspect it's an inflection point. If we want to verify that it's an inflection point, then we have to look at the second derivative. The second derivative should change signs there if that's an inflection point. Remember, an inflection point is where the concavity changes. That means the second derivative changes signs. So here to the left of negative 1, my second derivative is going to be positive. So it's concave up, just like we've drawn it. And to the right of negative 1, when I'm like closer to 0, this is going to be negative, so it's concave down. So in fact, x equals negative 1 is an inflection point. Now it could have been that minus 1 was a local maximum. It's not for sure that if the second derivative is 0, it's an inflection point. It just happened to be that way this time. The real thing we're doing in the optimization section is we're taking the maxes and mins of functions that we find using word problems. Imagine we want to make the following shape with a piece of wire. It's a rectangle of height h, and sitting on top of it is a half circle, let's say with radius r. So that means the base of this rectangle 
as with 2R. The question is, if I only have 10 meters of wire, how much area can I enclose? So I want to mention that we're just putting wire around the outside of this figure. We're not putting wire between the half circle and the rectangle. And we're trying to maximize the area inside the entire figure. So if we're going to be maximizing the area, maybe as a, a starting place, we can write an equation for the area. Well, the area is going to be the area of the rectangle added to the area of the half circle. The area of the rectangle is just base times height, and the area of the half circle is 1 half pi r squared. 1 half what the area of a full circle would be. So that's our area. This is what we want to maximize. But we have two problems with it right now. One problem is that there's two different variables, r and also h. We don't know how to maximize functions of two variables. The other problem is we haven't put any constraints. So if I think about what the biggest this function could be is, it's, it could be infinitely large. I could make a radius of a million and a height of two million. I could make this as large as I want. So I haven't taken into account that I only have 10 meters of wire. So now let's take into account that we only have 10 meters of wire. Well, that means the perimeter of this figure has to be at most 10. And in fact, we can make it 10 because using 9 meters of wire isn't going to give us a bigger area. So 10 is our perimeter. And to get that 10, we have h meters here and h meters here. We have 2r meters here. And then here along the top, we have half the circumference of a circle of radius r. The circumference of a circle of radius r is 2 pi r, so half of that is just pi times r. So now I have this relationship between r and h. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this to get h in terms of r, and then this number one builds in our constraint, and number two gets us down to one variable. So we've used this constraint to say that if I know r, I know the whole thing, or if I know h, I know r. If I know r, I know h, so I only need to know one of them. That builds in our constraint, and it also takes our area down to a function that we can maximize because it only has one variable. Now, maybe the easiest variable to solve here for is h. So this means that 2h is equal to 10 minus r times 2 plus pi. So h is 5 minus r times 1 plus pi over 2. Now I'm going to put this back into my area function. Area is 2 times r times h, which we found now in terms of r, plus 1 half pi r squared. Now this is the function we want to minimize. And again, let's take a little reality check. If r is like 0, that makes this a very long and skinny figure if r is very small. And I notice here, if I make r to be quite small, then this first term, which has a 2r in it, that's going to be quite small. And the second term is also going to be quite small. So if r is small, area is small. That's good. Now let's also think of r being quite large. If r is quite large, then h has to be quite small. So I, so I basically have this semicircle without much of a rectangle below it. And if r is quite large, then this term, well, this will probably go away, and I'll be left with half the area of a circle. And what we realize here is that maybe we should be a little bit careful and make sure that our domain is OK. I shouldn't have negative numbers for h and r. So that means r should be at least 0, and h should be at least 0. But my function is all in terms of r. And I know that h is 5 minus r times 1 plus pi over 2. So since this is h, should be at least 0. And indeed, if we have h equal to 0, then this thing is equal to 0. This term is equal to 0, and my entire area is just given by my half circle. So now let's focus on maximizing this function. Maybe we can clean it up a little. Now I see that it's just a parabola pointing down. So it's good to have these bounds for r, because they help us make sure that our function makes sense. But if the function I'm trying to maximize is just a parabola pointing down, then its maximum is going to be just the only critical point. So as long as the only critical point gives us a non-negative r, 
and a non-negative h will be fine. It'll be a reasonable value for r. So let's find the critical point of this guy. I set my derivative equal to 0. So that means my critical point occurs when r is 10 divided by 4 over 3 pi. That's my critical point. So because this is a parabola pointing down, its maximum value is going to be at its only critical point. So let's just make sure that this answer makes sense. If r is 10 over 4 plus 3 pi, that means h, remember we have h in terms of r, h is 5 minus r times 1 plus pi over 2. And as long as h is positive, this should make sense, right? We can double check that uh, our perimeter works out, but as long as h is positive, at least it sort of passes the stink test. At least it's not obviously wrong. So what I really want to make sure is that h is greater than or equal to 0. So that's the same as saying 5 is greater than or equal to this bit. So I can divide both sides by 5. Now I can multiply these denominators. And this is true, right? 4 is greater than 2 and 3 pi is greater than pi. So if I add two bigger things together, it should be bigger than two smaller things. So this is true. So h is positive. So this seems like a reasonable, a reasonable thing. We probably didn't make any silly mistakes. So we should be able to maximize the area by taking this as our r and h as this horrible function. And then as discussed, the area will be 2 times r times h plus 1 half pi r squared.